Oh, well, if you insist, please, thank you. <laughs> oh, boy. It takes one of everybody to make this place work, I'll tell you. Uh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Kurt Graham. It is my great honor and privilege to be the director of this fine institution. And uh, we're pleased to welcome you here on behalf of uh, the library and the institute, my good friend Alex Burden and uh, Pat Ottensmeyer is here somewhere, our board chair and sundry other board members uh, here. We had a board meeting this afternoon. A uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful group of people, great uh, amount of support for this institution. And this is an exciting evening for us for lots of reasons, but um, we're kicking off our fall event schedule more or less tonight. And so we have a lot of really exciting programs coming up and we look forward to seeing you all here in the coming weeks and months. Uh, th that is, in the unlikely event of a government shutdown, please secure your own mask before helping anyone on, on the side of you and we will we'll get through this together, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, anyway, I would say write to your congressman but it won't make a dang bit of difference. So just, um, I I'm going to, uh, introduce someone who is going to uh, introduce the program and tonight's speaker, but before I do that, I wanted to call attention. I mentioned our board being here and the great uh, volunteer leadership that we've had over the years. One such couple are John and Mary Hunkler who are here with us on the front row and they have generously for the last several years underwritten this uh, book program, the book award program that we have every year and of course bringing us tonight's uh, fabulous talk that we're looking forward to. And I uh, want to thank uh, John and Mary for their service, not only their, their generosity in funding this program. Mary served 18 years on the Truman Library Institute board, uh, three of those years as the board chair and many years um, as vice chair. And so they've been involved with us in both our direction and uh, our, our uh, strategery, I believe, is a word I've heard used before. Um, but also um, uh, incredibly generous in terms of their donations and also with their time and have been just wonderful people to work with and appreciate. Uh, uh, and I only see partly out of one eye and I just miss my eye doctor who retired a few years ago. That's another, uh, another, another one of John's great contributions to our community. But anyway, I want to introduce uh, another board member, uh, Dr. Jason Parker, who is a member of the history faculty at Texas A&M University. Uh, we always have some brilliant scholars on our board because they bring so many great connections and so many great insights to our to our work. And uh, Jason is here tonight to introduce uh, tonight's speaker and to uh, let us know how the program is going to unfold. So following his introduction, we'll hear from our uh, speaker and then we'll um, have some Q&A, I believe, at the end and we'll take it from there. Jason. Thank you, Kurt. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Mary and John, for your generosity in making this possible. As Kurt noted, um, I'm a history professor at Texas A&M, but I am a longtime supporter uh, and beneficiary of the Truman Library. Uh, it has been central to much of my own research. Christian and I swim in the same waters in U.S. foreign policy and Cold War history. Uh, and the library is renowned among scholars for its generosity, but all of that is made possible by support from communities like this one. So thank you right off the bat. Uh, as part of my duties on the Board of Directors, uh, I chair the Truman Book Award Committee, which every two years uh, rounds up historians like me to read the best of the books published in the previous two years about the Truman years. We decided in 2022 that the recipient would be Christian Osterman. Christian has directed the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., uh, its history and public policy program and specifically of benefit to scholars, its Cold War International History Project since 1997-1998. Together with Leopoldo Nuti at Roma Tre University, he co-directs the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project and co-edits the Cambridge History of the Nuclear Age. He is a member of the editorial board of the journal Cold War History and is currently curating an international exhibition on the Berlin Wall in the Cold War, Living in a Divided World. Fellowship awards include a dissertation fellowship from the Truman Library Institute, here, a Nobel Institute Fellowship and a Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin. The book that we're here to honor tonight, we had to get in line to do so because Between Containment and Rollback has received not only the Truman Book Award, but also from the Organization of American Historians, the largest organization of American historians, 
the Richard W. Leopold Prize, as well as honorable mention for the Michael Hunt Prize in International History from our shared guild of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. I should add, uh, just because it's fun, and maybe we'll get some good commentary and discussion of it later, that Christian's next book is on the longest serving spy master in East German uh, from the whole of the Cold War. Uh, I would like to invite Christian to the stage for some staged photos with your indulgence. Uh, please join me in welcoming Christian to Independence. Thank you very much, Jason, for this kind introduction. Mr. Chairman, members of the board of the Truman Library Institute, directors Burden and Graham, uh, Mr. Ms. Hankler, uh, dear friends and colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. Before I get into my talk and uh, uh, the weeds of the Cold War in Germany, I would like to express my profound gratitude for being awarded the Harry S. Truman Book Prize. My voice is kind of going, so I'm hoping I'll make it through the talk, but um, uh, signal me if I need to speak up. <clears throat> it's a great honor to receive this prize, given the illustrious scholars who have gone before me, before me some of them my intellectual heroes. It's also a privilege and a pleasure to receive this prize from an institution that has had a profound influence on my career. The Truman Library supported some of my early career research, and I have fond memories of my early visits, including meeting the great Liz Safly and uh, other members of the staff uh, back in the Stone Age. These visits were some of my earliest experience with, archive, um, uh, with archives and um, uh, I was greeted with, uh, into this experience, into the archives with warmth and the helpfulness which has stayed with me over the years. In some sense, these visits were transformational in that they helped steer me into a career both in public service and history at the intersection of scholarship and public policy. In re recent years, I've been mostly able to follow the library's activities from afar, but I congratulate you f uh, on con <clears throat> creating such a hospitable and thriving intellectual environment, thriving institution, an amazing exhibit which I was able uh, to visit this afternoon, uh, an, inst an institution that continues to explore the Truman era and its relevance for today. So the Truman Library really holds a very special place in my heart, in my scholar's heart, and I'm immensely humbled and thankful for this recognition. My book, Containment and Roll Back, the United States and the Cold War in Germany, revisits US policy towards Germany during the height, the early uh, phases of the Cold War between 1945 and 1953, 55. Now, one may ask, is there anything new to say about US policy towards Germany in the Truman years? After decades of research and virtually libraries full of books on the subject, many of them funded and supported by the Institute. Take, for example, Thomas Allen Schwartz's masterful America's Germany, John J. McCloy and the Federal Republic of Germany, published in 1991. A classic study of the early American relationship with the fledgling Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, and the previous Truman Book Prize winner. America's Germany, alongside with a host of other American and German works on the subject, underlined the importance of Germany as a crucible for US containment strategy in Europe after World War II. This research has underscored the role of <clears throat> the role in uh, the US role in the post-war division of Germany and Berlin, the formation of the free West Berlin outpost. It has traced the difficult process of aligning West Germany politically, militarily with the West and forging the US-West German alliance that played such an important role in bringing about 
German unification in 1990 and the peaceful end of the Cold War. And yet there is indeed more to say about the Cold War in Germany, in part due to a bonanza of FOIA releases and MR releases that I was able to obtain for my book, in part due to the opening of the former Communist World Archives since the early 1990s, um, an effort in which I have um, tried to play a helpful role through the Cold War International History Project. We now have a large corpus of work that is based on previously closed Warsaw Pact archives and added the perspective of the other side in the Cold War to our understanding of that conflict. Illuminating Soviet and communist policy in post-war Germany, highlighting the pervasive and coercive nature of Soviet rule and control, as well as the changing nature of relations between the Soviet occupiers and the German communists. My book builds on these historiographic projects by asking two questions um, that were largely ignored. How did events in the Soviet zone, later Eastern Germany, affect American perceptions and policy in Germany? And what policies and strategies in turn did the United States pursue vis-a-vis -vis the East? Answering these questions, now possible based on declassified Russian, uh, Western, German archival uh, evidence gets us closer to a truly international history of the most important battleground of the early Cold War, Germany, the interplay of Western allies, the Soviets, and Germans in East and West. In this brief talk, I can only highlight some of the findings and themes of my book. You'll be glad to know that, because one of my reviewers called the book a tour de force, others called it dense, uh, so I'm pretty sure that is not what you signed up for, for tonight. The core argument made in my book is that the Truman administration backed and at some length pursued a much more proactive policy towards communist Eastern Germany than previous scholarship has acknowledged, a policy of not just containing, but in fact attempting to roll back Soviet and communist power in East Germany. These efforts did not lead, as we know, to an early demise of the communist, regi of the communist regime in East Germany, but they kept both Soviets and East German communists on edge underlined the lack of democratic legitimacy of the East German state and helped keep alive the spirit of resistance behind the Iron Curtain. That spirit of resistance exploded in a popular uprising in East Germany in June 1953, nearly toppling the regime of communist strongman uh, Walter Ulbricht. The United States did not instigate this first major uprising behind uh, the Iron Curtain in, in East Central Europe after World War II, preceding uh, others you know, that, that followed 1956 in Poland and Hungary, 1968 in Czechoslovakia, 1980, 81 in Poland. But it certainly had hoped that such an event would lead to the disintegration of the Soviet bloc. The uprising in 1953 also raised questions about the ultimate rationale behind rollback policies as Washington saw itself confronted with the fact that responsibly, it could do very little to support the open rebellion in the face of the largest Soviet military intervention to date. It brought home powerfully that the ultimate, ultimate success of any rollback in the Soviet bloc depended on Moscow's decision not to support its client regime, something that would only occur with Mikhail Gorbachev's decision in 1988, 1989 to abandon the Brezhnev doctrine that had for many years justified Soviet interventions in support of client communist regimes. I will focus in my talk on the 1949-1953 period, but I do want to make a, a short point about the early occupation period during which Germany was divided. A division that was not the result of any long-term planning by any of the emerging Cold War adversaries, but was rather due to the Allied inability enhanced by German complicity to prevail over the other side. In my book, I trace just such an effort to prevail, the efforts of the chief of the US occupation zone, General Lucius de Clay, to roll back Soviet and communist influence from Eastern Germany by cooperating with the Soviets. Clay had arrived in Europe in early April 1945 and had been impressed with the practical challenges facing the United States in Germany, especially the calamitous food situation. By the time the big three convened for their summit in, uh, in Potsdam, Stalin, uh, Churchill, and, um, uh, and Truman, Clay had conducted 
um, had concluded that treating Germany as a single economic unit was the only way to address the food shortages, the economic dislocations, and the trade imbalances that beset the American occupation mission in Germany. It also held out the potential to extend American influence into the Soviet zone. Unified treatment of Germany required continued allied, especially Soviet cooperation. Clay combined the top military brasses, brothers in arms, empathy for Soviet hardships and security interests with a supreme confidence in the superiority of the American political economic system. He was willing to look past Red Army excesses in the Russian excesses in the Russian area, and Soviet occupation policies impressed him as largely self-defeating and ineffective. Whereas many within the State Department, including Truman's Secretary of State, James F. Burns, increasingly emphasized unbridgeable, unbridgeable ideological differences with the Soviets as impediments for any longer-term cooperation, Clay was inclined to believe that the ideological competition would work out to the advantage of the West, of the West if such competition could take place throughout Germany. Clay believed that the promise of reparations from the West was a key lever built into the Potsdam system to, to incentivize Soviet cooperation. He was particularly interested to install so-called German central administrations, German staffed administration, administrative organs that worked under allied control to implement countrywide policies. If these central agencies could be made to work across Germany, that is, if therefore the Soviet, the Soviet controlled occupation zone retained a degree of openness and ties with its Western parts, Clay believed the zone would eventually gravitate West and so might other parts of Soviet controlled Central Europe. Now the French, the story is well known, were opposed to the idea of resurrecting any sort of German governmental authority uh, so soon after the end of the war. And so they famously vetoed the idea on October 1st, 1945, some months into the occupation. What is less well known is the extent to which Clay was willing to go to establish such agencies. In a one-on-one -on -one conversation with his counterpart, the Soviet uh, deputy uh, military governor, Vasily Sokolovsky, the day after the French veto, nowhere to be found in the US, US archives, but captured in the Russian records, now available, Clay remarkably proposed to establish central administrations for their two zones, a big step towards the US-Soviet by zone. Then the others, the so <coughs> um, uh, Sokolovsky reported Clay saying, would willy-nilly have to follow. This was almost a year before announcing the establishment of the US-British buy zone that then grew into uh, Western Germany. In November of that year, Clay reiterated to Zokolovsky his offer of establishing joint central administrations, a signal that the United States had no intention of joining any Western bloc projects and that effective cooperation between our two countries was possible. But the Soviets were uh, more were more, um, uh, very suspicious of Clay's initiative, which they revealingly characterized as the allied campaign against, against the walling off of the zone. So they rejected Clay's proposal. As Clay grew ever more insistent in the spring of 1946, Soviet officials portrayed the Truman administration and Clay as pursuing a policy of the open door throughout Germany that would give the United States the opportunity to undermine Soviet influence. Still, in informal talks between US and Soviet officials in the summer and fall of 1946, also traceable in the Russian documents, there is now tantalizing evidence of the outlines of a compromise deal that traded reparations for the Soviets, for Soviet agreement to central administrations and the elimination of uh, zonal borders. By mid-October mid 1946, Clay's political advisor and top, the top US diplomat in Germany, Robert Murphy, felt so encouraged by the prospects of a mutually agreeable reparations plan that he ventured, we would be, we would be well advised to use the opportunity regarding the introduction of democratic methods in the Soviet zone. Well aware that by 1946, the Soviets enjoyed little support among the German population, 
Clay expected that a unified German state would be a gain for Western democracy and enable, uh, enable it to extend its frontiers to the borders of Poland and Czechoslovakia, thus encouraging any will, for, <coughs> any will for democracy in the peoples of these countries. This is quite a noteworthy and little understood episode, especially in light of the fact that much of the recent scholarship has emphasized the American decision to divide Germany, as uh, one book was famously entitled. And here we see, no, for the first two years anyways, Clay, um, uh, uh, Clay aimed uh, for a united Germany for, for uh, uh, um, expanding uh, American influence um, uh, throughout all of Germany. Eventually, Clay saw his more expansive vision of American influence throughout Germany and Eastern Europe undercut by the so by Soviet dictator Stalin's reticence to, relinqu to relinquish control of his zone, as well as mounting anxieties within the Truman administration over Soviet intentions. With the growing Cold War confrontation, crises from Iran to Eastern Europe reverberated into allied relations and politics in Germany and pulled the rug out um, from under the tentative feelers for a compromise solution on reparations and German unity. By late 1947, Clay had come full circle, launching an anti-communist public campaign that prefigured some of the psychological warfare operations against East Germany in later years. This was the Clay we mostly remember, the hardline anti-communist, the father of the West State solution, the hero of the Berlin blockade of 1948-49 who had been willing to fight his way through Soviet lines to maintain the credibility of America's commitment to a free West Berlin. Stymied in his effort to roll back Soviet power by integration, to roll back Soviet power by integration, Clay became a staunch supporter of rollback through uh, what was at the time called psychological warfare, propaganda and all sorts of other operations short of military means to influence opinion behind the Iron Curtain. Let's fast forward to 1949-50. Um, uh, Stalin's effort with the Berlin Brocade uh, launched in June 1948. All of you Truman connoisseurs will know all of this history, I think. Um, Stalin's effort with the blockade to prevent the founding of a separate West German state in the Western occupation zones had fa has failed spectacularly. The blockade ends in May 1949. September, the West Germans elect an anti-communist and pro-Western Konrad Adenauer as the first chancellor of the West German Federal Republic. Adenauer is committed to the political and economic and eventually military integration of the Federal Republic with the West optimistic that this would allow him to regain uh, full sovereignty for his country and in due course, the unification of the entire country from a position of strength vis-a-vis -vis the East. From Washington's perspective, however, the situation looked far less promising. Choreographed by Stalin to blame Germany's division on the West, the setup of the, of the communist-run German Democratic Republic, East Germany, GDR, in the Soviet zone in October 1949 appeared to give the USSR new momentum and new opportunity in Germany. It jolted the smugness which has surrounded both allies and Germans at Bonn, um, the West German capital, since the founding of the Federal Republic, the New York Times acerbic but perceptive German borough chief Drew Middleton commented. Officials within the Truman administration were indeed concerned. From Moscow, US Ambassador Alex Kirk predicted that East Germany would serve the Kremlin primarily as a strategic base for conquest, not only of Berlin, but of the far more important Western zones, including the key industrial rural area and eventual domination of Europe. Stalin's blessing, the GDR as the cornerstone of a united Germany revealed to Kirk the manner in which the Kremlin had endeavored to ride two horses at once, the rapid communization of the Soviet zone, East Germany, and the capture of all of Germany. No less evocative in his language was the man who would, 
would be responsible for leading American policy in Germany after 1949, John J. McCloy, the newly minted High Commissioner. He intoned that the United States was facing the next phase in the struggle for the soul of Faust. The creation of the GDR, said McCloy, had injected a new threat into post-war German politics, and at a minimum, the Soviets had acquired an important new propaganda tool. East Germany would not just be another Soviet vassal state. The Soviets, McCloy surmised, might be planning to make East Germany their major satellite. As if to make the point, within weeks of its, its establishment, the new East German government developed a frenzy of activities. On February 22nd, 1950, the new GDR foreign minister, Georg Dertinger, publicly demanded the immediate conclusion of a peace treaty with a united Germany and described the communist German Democratic Republic as the trustee of the entire German people. In the, <clears throat> in the first of a number of public campaigns confronting the West over German unity, the communist leadership constituted a national front that demanded the reunification of Germany through a national plebiscit, the termination of the occupation institute in West Germany, and the expansion of trade with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. By contrast, Truman officials admitted internally in the, in the uh, following months, in the months following the founding of the GDR, American efforts had themselves been almost exclusively of a defensive character. In April, the CIA told Truman that the essential condition for securing the adhesion of Germany to the West was to minimize the internal effectiveness and external appeal of the, of communist -dominated, the communist-dominated East German regime. In my book, I trace McCloy's efforts to put together a strategy to counter Soviet the Soviet East German offensive. The first thing McCloy did was to, uh, was to set up an innovative bureaucratic node that would coordinate such efforts across the High Commission, the US High Commission. In doing so, he drew on his deep involvement as Assistant Secretary of War in the creation of the US national security bureaucracy in the late war, in the late war and early post-war years. One of his principal contributions had been the creation in 1944 of the State Navy War Coordinating Committee, which helped to coordinate the government's psychological warfare efforts. The committee was a forerunner to the National Security Council, a high-level decision-making body within the Administration for National Security, and of the Psychological Strategy Board, launched in 1951, which conducted planning for psychological warfare operations against the Soviet bloc throughout the US government. While much has been written about the National Security, County, uh, National Security Council and the PSB, the High Commissioner's Political and Economic Projects Committee, PEPCO as this uh, committee was called, has escaped scrutiny, no doubt in part because many of its proceedings and activities were classified. Composed of the chiefs of political, economic, public affairs and intelligence branches of the US High Commission, the US government in Germany, the committee met weekly and oversaw the coordination of US operations in Germany, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets and the East Germans, with the aim of anticipating, countering, and frustrating moves by the East. In effect, PEPCO became the operational and intelligence headquarters for a more concerted approach towards the GDR, McCloy's kitchen cabinet for the Cold War in Germany. A second step by the Truman administration was to institute a diplomatic blo blockade against the communist government in East Germany. The GDR had decried the Western Federal Republic as a separatist puppet regime at the hands of the Western allies, considered itself to be the first independent all-German government, and claimed to speak not just for Eastern Germans, but for Germans, the German people as a whole. Stalin had provided the newly fashioned GDR government the trappings of sovereignty, such as a foreign ministry, which the West Germans were no notably lacking and diplomatic recognition by Soviet sphere governments. East German communists also hoped that growing international acceptance of their German state would enhance its legitimacy and internal con consolidation in the face of its uh, rather stark democratic and economic shortcomings. West German Chancellor Adenauer swiftly rejected the East German government's claim to represent all of Germany, declaring in October 1949, shortly after the founding of the GDR, that the Federal Republic was the sole legitimate state organization of the German people. 
Even before Adenauer's declaration, the Western allies had dismissed the so-called government of the People's Republic of Germany as an artificial creation, pointing to the undemocratic installment of the communist regime and the postponement of elections the Western allies declared that this so-called government was devoid of any legal basis and had no right to rep represent Eastern Germany. It had even smaller claim to speak in the name of Germany as a whole. In November, Western foreign ministers firmed up the common line towards the GDR. They would neither recognize the GDR diplomatically nor take any actions that would imply recognition. The Western uh, endorsement of Adenauer's stance Shop, uh, stopped short of a full embrace of his government's claim to be the sole legal successor of the German Reich. Nonetheless, the coordinated Western response in isolating East Germany on a global scale was a remarkable step. After all, after all only a few years later, Washington had quickly resigned itself to recognizing, uh, uh, quickly uh, resigned itself um, to recognizing similar communist gov communist-led governments in Warsaw and other East, German cap East European capitals. The joint diplomatic blockade of East Germany also contrasted with the divided Western response to the other communist state established in 1949, the People's Republic of China. The Truman administration had, had chosen <clears throat> to back the claim of the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek that they represented the only legal government of China. The British government, by contrast, had recognized the PRC on January 5th, 1950. But when it came to East Germany, non-recognition um, by Washington and its European allies demonstrated a common front. Well, Washington alerted West, the Western Hemisphere and Marshall Plan recipient governments to US interests in this matter. The British government pressed Commonwealth governments to adopt a similar attitude. They also actively shored up support for non-recognition of the East German regime among European neutrals. A lot of them had, a, had major stakes, major interest in East Germany. Third, while the diplomatic blockade, blockade denied the GDR legitimacy at the international level, McCloy also came to understand that critical to regaining the political initiative in Germany was the West's ability to roll back East German initiatives in the public discourse on the issue of the day German unity. Carefully crafted by PEPCO, McCloy declared on February 28, 1950, barely a week after the East German foreign minister had made his call for a peace treaty, that German unification based on free all German elections was a principal objective of American policy. And a day later, he specified October 15, the presumptive day of the long-delayed elections to the East German parliament as the date for elections to be held. Though the issue was highly controversial within the administration, free elections, um, US planners calculated, would capture the imagination of the East German population and expose the travesty of the GDR parliamentary elections. German Communist Party records reveal that McCloy issued his proposal the very day that the East German Communist Party was involved in sensitive internal negotiations with the increasingly docile East German non-communist parties over agreeing to a unity, a uh, single slate of candidates for the October elections. McCloy's well-timed free election initiative highlighted the undemocratic nature of the proposed unity list and complicated the SED's, the Communist Party's task by encouraging and prolonging resistance by the non-communist party leaders. At least one of them probably was on the payroll of the CIA or uh, US intelligence agency and hence uh, the timing of um, perhaps of McCloy's um, uh, announcement. U.S. official in the following weeks, U.S. officials planned for an all-out campaign for free all-German elections directed at East Germans, demanding in the word of one over-eager participant that this line, free all-German elections, must be hammered until it comes as naturally to every German mind as eating. But it took two events, one well known, one much less so for McCloy to gear up, gear up American efforts to counter the Soviet East German offensive. The Deutschlandtreffen, 
a large international youth rally in Berlin planned by the communist-controlled Free German Youth for the end of May um, of 1950 and the outbreak of the Korean War in late June 1950. The youth rally has received almost no mention in the literature, but at the time it was hailed at the, as the great test of 1950. For weeks that spring, the impending free German youth plans to storm Berlin, another Berlin crisis, preoccupied US allied West German officials at the highest levels. The staging of the youth rally for Germany with an expected 500,000 participants from around the world promised to be the largest event of its kind in post-war Germany thus far. For the Communist Party, the rally would provide an impressive sounding board for its propaganda, showcase East Germany's superiority and standing in the international arena, and dramatically underscore its putative all-German appeal. The Free German Youth ambitious young leader, the future Communist Party leader, uh, Erich Honecker, was eager to demonstrate the fighting force of his organization that his organization could bring to bear in the East-West confrontation. Honecker envisioned thousands of free German youth members dressed in their widely recognized blue uniforms crossing the sector border in Berlin from east to west under the slogan, the free German youth storms Berlin and marching in several columns into the west. Alarming reports about the rally uh, reaching the administration soon abounded. Intelligence sources confirmed that East German public declarations that the, FD, that the Free German Youth was planning to send contingents of 10 to 12,000 well-trained FDJ Free German Youth members to the West as blitz groups for agitation and demonstration purposes. One member at a Free German Youth leadership media, meeting allegedly remarked that a certain number of dead must be expected. Other sources indicated that the rally would be used to instruct and train the youth in East Germany and Berlin in the art of cold revolution, which would produce what the blockade failed to achieve, namely unified Berlin under communist hegemony. The New York Times warned on its front page in mid-March that the descent of more than 500,000 FD Free German Youth members upon Berlin to invade and overrun Berlin was the touchstone of Russian ambitions in Germany. Echoing media reports, Senator Miller Tidings, Democrat Maryland, the chairman of the Senate Armed uh, Services Committee speculated publicly that there may be some shooting at the planned rally. Behind the facade of studied normalcy, US and allied officials engaged in extensive planning for a violent confrontation, increasing the West Berlin police force, authorizing the use of tear gas, smoke bombs, gas masks, and water throwers, which with six to 7,000 allied occupation troops readied, readied as the second line of defense. Joint Western um, allied maneuvers close to the east-west east German border would allow for an emergency road march over the Autobahn to Berlin. The Western zones readied some 75,000 rounds of canister bullets available for use in Berlin. Allied preparations included covert confusion broadcasts by US radio stations announcing that the rally had been called off. And thousands of leaflets uh, were infiltrated into East Germany to discourage participation. The top commander in Europe, General Thomas Handy, cabled Washington that psychological warfare was being pushed aggressively by all means and that extensive undercover operations are being conducted in the East Zone, East Germany, to undermine uh, support for the rally. Still, by mid-April, Truman administration officials were wondering whether they had an international crisis of major proportions on their hands. Ambassador-at-large Philip Jessup, who had just played a, a role in ending and resolving the Berlin blockade, the uh, the Berlin blockade crisis the previous year, now favored of alerting the UN Security Council. At the end of April, Secretary of the Army Frank Pace ra raised the Berlin rally at the National Security Council, seeking approval of the progressive application of military measures as planned. Truman administration officials now went public in their efforts to demonstrate to Soviet um, and East German officials that Western and Western Berliners alike that the West was resolved to fight in the face of belligerent free German youth pronouncement. Among these signal 
among these signaling efforts were the special anti-riot drills that US troops conducted that month in Berlin. In April, West Berlin residents gazed in amazement as US infantrymen with fixed bayonets drove back a fictitious mob of thousands of communists impersonated by 800 jeering US constabulary troopers in a smoke wreath exercise in the Grunewald, the city's central park. The papers held the simulation as a realistic show of anti-riot strength. Once it was over, the Truman administration officials signed side relief Side in relief when the monster youth rally uh, came and went without major incidents. We have defected another, another blow to Berlin, McCloy cabled Atchison. Yet it was not lost on the Truman administration that the East German leaders were equally jubilant about the organizational feat and the psychological impact of the rally, especially on the youth. U.S. officials were impressed by the foreign and post totalitarian order taking hold in East Germany reinforcing McCloy's frustrations with the fundamental handicap of not being able to exert a full measure of influence on East Germans. Nevertheless, the Soviets had not won the battle for the German mines, and McCloy argued that the ultimate tipping scales in Germany would largely depend on each side's deploying power in sharper focus than either antagonist has thus far brought to bear on the German scene. Within a month, the outbreak of the Korean War in June 1950 reverberated powerfully in Cold War tensions in Europe, especially in Germany. Across Western Europe, news of the North Korean invasion prompted fears that the USSR might engage in a Korean-style proxy war on the continent and prefigured an East German attack on the Federal Republic. Along major westward roads from East Germany, West German Chancellor Adenauer told the Western High Commissioners on June, 9, June 29th, West German residents were anxious that Soviet tanks might suddenly start rolling through their villages. In Bonn, officials' reactions verged on the hysterical, McCloy staff reported. In the days after the outbreak of the war in Korea, the U.S. High Commission was besieged by German requests for air tickets to the United States, and German federal government employees demanded to be equipped with weapons to shoot invading communists. The Korean War decisively shifted opinions within the Truman administration in favor of German rearmament to strengthen West European defenses. But a German military contribution to Western Europe, um, given the very deep-seated uh, Western European reservations, would be a longer-term proposition. From the perspective of the Truman administration, that very prospect lent even greater urgency to dealing with the growing political and military capabilities of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, brought into sharper relief by the North Korean invasion. East Germany's growing capacity to attempt a coup in the Korean pattern had been, McCloy cabled to Washington, the most significant change in the Berlin situation. In the wake of these two blows, the Deutschland Treffen and the Korean War, um, McCloy began to push for a more concerted psychological warfare effort vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets and the East German communists. In the fall, McCloy hired two external consultants, Wallace Carroll and Hans Speyer, to review and develop your strategy vis-a-vis -vis the GDR. A veteran journalist who had managed the UPI uh, bureau in London and reported from the USSR in 1941, Carroll had headed the overseas branch of the Office of War Information during World War II. Speyer, a German emigre who had worked under Carroll during the war, was a veteran of the occupation, U.S. occupation government's uh, information control division in Germany, a founder of RAND, and a psychological warfare expert. Within weeks, Carroll and Speyer produced an outline for a new U.S. strategy in Germany that was strident in tone and sweeping in assumptions. Their 38-page top-secret December 1st report, Psychological Warfare in Germany, released to me in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, argued that the objective of U.S. policy was to integrate the whole of Germany into Western Europe and thus turn it into a partner in the building of a healthy international community. To achieve a united Germany, the West tied to the West politically and militarily, the United States had to destroy Soviet power in Germany. For this purpose, aggressive psychological warfare waged with a fixed purpose would be required. Echoing McCloy, they urged the administration to shed the vestiges of our defensive mentality and launch a great psychological warfare offensive directed towards making the GDR a liability to the Soviets. 
The goal was to force the Kremlin to withdraw from East Germany, an effort that they aptly named Operation Exit. They proposed a catalog of measures ranging from economic warfare to the display of military might, but what set Carol, Speyer, Carol and Speyer's recommendation apart from other ideas that had been germinating within the administration was their focus on German resistance in the Soviet zone. Carol and Speyer advocated that anti-communist activities in the GDR move from intelligence and propaganda work to resistance proper. This would include infiltration of selected East German organizations, um, sabotage, abduction, and direct action against highly placed functionaries. The Carol Speyer report reflected the heightened sense of urgency felt by officials in Washington, Bonn, and Berlin in the fall of 1950 about the need to destabilize communist rule uh, in East Germany and to diminish the country's political, military, and economic capacity. Truman administration officials to con continue to discuss and operationalize intensifying resistance work inside East Germany. In 1951, PEPCO approved action plans that anticipated strengthening resistance to the East German communist regime and preparation for, a more active and or, for more active and organized forms of resistance after June 1952, a year before the widespread uh, opposition erupted in the uprising of 1953. Another plan called for a five-year plan for liberation that was to convey to East Germans that the liberation of East Germany is confidently expected within a period from three to five years hence. Carroll, by 1952 still advising the Truman administration on yet another psychological warfare plan, argued that with a healthy, growing resistance movement in Germany, liberating East Germany was less difficult and ambitious project than the Marshall Plan. Such overly optimistic scenarios notwithstanding, declassified US and German documents shed light on a host of activities that altogether uh, amount to a rollback effort that has not fully been appreciated in its scope and depth. Among the most effective weapons were in the psychological warfare chest were overt Western radio programs, especially the radio in the American sector, RIAS in Berlin, widely listened to throughout East Germany. Overt and gray activities included financial and log logistical support of hundreds of anti-communist books and thousands of pamphlets and posters for distribution via special channels to East Germans. Agencies, Western agencies distributed uh, Western, often anti-communist books and magazines, many of them funded by the CIA. George Orwell's 1984 was a particular favorite. Radio and literature allowed East Germans to, to access alternate sources of information and provided tangible connections to the West. In the economic sphere, um, the Truman administration tried to get the West Germans to embargo critical resources and supplies, such as steel and machinery, leveraging East Germany's traditional dependence on the industrial capacities in Western Germany to disrupt GDR operation deliveries to the Soviet Union and reduce the GDR's economic contribution to the Soviet military industrial complex. Um, PEPCO also authorized a number of defection programs for top scientists and key technical personnel from East Germany and targeted supply chains for the GDR's top industrial plants. Um, at some length in, the, in, in late 1952, U.S. officials also considered the possibility of encouraging mass flight from East Germany, especially among the male youth that was affected by uh, the uh, militarization drive in East Germany. CIA Director Walter Battle Smith became an ardent advocate of the important strategic nature of mass defection from East Germany, but the already rising numbers of refugees by then streaming through the open border in Berlin to the West, some 10,000 per month since August 1952 overtook such plans. Finally, perhaps most importantly, U.S. <clears throat> psychological warfare efforts um, in, within these psychological warfare efforts, the United States co-opted and instrumentalized a network of West German anti-communist organizations with deep reach into the GDR. Largely operating out of West Berlin, these private groups were inspired by American rollback visions 
acted with political, operational, and financial support from US and allied intelligence agencies and pursued more radical rollback agendas without ever submitting fully to US control. Two of the most important ones were the Investigative Committee for Free Lawyers and the Fighting Group Against Humanity. There's evidence to suggest that the CIA actually recruited the head of the Investigative Committee uh, to lead this organization. Um, and um, uh, the CIA highly valued uh, the Free Jurists Committee, the Free Lawyers Committee. The Free Lawyers never condoned violent acts of resistance, differing in that respect from the other uh, organization, the Fighting Group Against Inhumanity, which emerged as the most radical of these anti-communist groups. After 1950, when the CIA took over handling and funding the Fighting Group, its activities across the Iron Curtain grew increasingly more militant and hard-hitting. Its activities ranged from removing and disfiguring communist posters to sabotage projects involving arson, explosion, and even assassination attempts. Fighting group agents launched balloons carrying propaganda material across the zonal border, blackmailed communist officials, exposed Soviet and East German security personnel, and carried out acts of sabotage against East German government structures and vehicles. Owing to, in part, growing penetration by Soviet and East German intelligence, a good number of these operations resulted in failures, collateral damage, and massive waves of the rest in East Germany, drawing increasing criticism by the West German government and public. In 1951, 52 alone, the Soviet uh, and East German authorities arrested hundreds of people in the GDR, allegedly in connection with activities of the fighting group. In conclusion then, well before the Eisenhower administration took power in 1953, the Truman administration had developed a much sharper, largely secret rollback edge to its containment strategy in Germany and elsewhere, belying criticism by Republic Republicans that the Truman-style containment had been passive, defensive, and stagnant. If you recall, that was a big issue in the 1952 campaign. To be sure, many of these rollback plans, projects, and operations were problematic, flawed, viewed critical, if not outright opposed by British, French, and West German governments. They likely contributed to mistaken expectations by many East Germans for Western support during the 1953 uprising. Questions about their ultimate rationale and ends, destabilization, uprising, German unity, at what cost, remained unresolved. Soviet concerns over the piercing intelligence and psychological warfare activities emanating from West Berlin contributed to Soviet leader Khrushchev's ultimately futile efforts in 1958-1961 to dislodge the Western allies from West Berlin. In the 1960s, these rollback activities gave way to efforts by West German government to cooperate with East German authorities to alleviate the suffering behind the Iron Curtain, renew and strengthen connections between East and West, and to slowly transform the East German dictatorship from within. In some sense, these efforts hark back to Clay's rollback through cooperation. Perhaps then the rollback policies and activities of the 1950s were the darker side to Americans' containment efforts centered on the creation of and support of a vibrant West German democracy and market economy. But at the time, they were deemed in an integral part of fighting the Cold War short of military conflict, critical to keeping the Soviets and East German communists off balance, and vital to keeping hope for a future in freedom and prosperity alive behind the Iron Curtain. American rollback efforts were an important dimension of the early Cold War drama in Germany. Their history informs public policy as we face a new Cold War. And they echo in the public memory discussions in Germany today. As such, their story needed to be told. Thank you. Time for a few questions, so, yes? Do you see a similarity in Putin's strategy in Ukraine to recreate, recreate an environment 
like the Soviets had in East Germany? Um, <clears throat> I'm not a Ukraine or a Russian expert, but um, uh, it's very clear that um, uh, the trends in Russia are headed very much in the direction of an authoritarian government, not necessarily um, a communist or, uh, you know, um, uh, a government, but one that has uh, stamped out free media, um, that has, uh, is, arrested, is arresting and killing uh, opposition, members of the opposition in Russia and abroad. Um, so um, there are remarkable um, uh, parallels between the totalitarian um, society system in the Soviet Union and what Russia is heading towards under Putin. I think I'll leave it at that. Saw him too. Uh, I'm an admirer of Harry Truman, but at one point we were the only ones in the world with the bomb. MacArthur, Patton, both wanted to go against China and Russia. What's your feeling on that? Um, my feeling on, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Well, we had an opportunity to stop it all at one point because we were the only ones with the atomic bomb. And we did not do that, and Truman was president of the United States at that time. Now, I know we were all very tired of war, but what's your feeling on Truman stopping these two tyrants from taking over the world, which they were trying to do, and that's Stalin and Mao Zedong? Yeah, the thing about the atomic age is that if you get into a military conflict, it will have, you know, devastating um, uh, human and environmental uh, uh, consequences, not just uh, for those that you attack, but also, um, uh, you know, on a, on a global scale. By the time of the Korean War, um, uh, the Russians, the Soviets, had successfully tested their first nuclear bomb. Um, and so you, while there was um, definitely until uh, the late 1950s, a huge, um, into the 1960s even, a huge superiority um, and on, in nuclear terms uh, on the part of the United States, um, both the, the risks of uh, a nuclear exchange and the, um, um, the, the, you know, criticism that this would, opposition this would have garnered within global public opinion, I think, made this um, uh, a forbidding option um, for responsible U.S. Um, policymakers. Uh, thanks for coming. I can't remember if John Marshall was Secretary of State for George, yeah. both terms of Truman. And if he wasn't, I could see how everything got turned around. Thank you for that comment. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I was. I just purchased the book this evening. Haven't a chance. Haven't had a chance to read Thank it, you. of course. And, and I went back to the index, and I noticed there was nothing regarding Great Britain or the United Kingdom. And I was wondering if you could tell us that there was any joint operations between <coughs> the Americans and the Brits. Thank you for. This. Thank you for 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 that question. That's a good question. It's one of the things I had to cut out of an already very long presentation. Um, I did research in the British archives because uh, the British have a diplomatic style that is in many ways much more candid and pointed, and so it's a wonderful way to actually reflect on um, US uh, diplomacy through um, uh, uh, British uh, documents. Um, 
they were clearly joint US-British um, operations in Berlin and in Germany behind um, uh, the Iron Curtain in East Germany and Eastern Europe. Um, I don't have a whole lot of information about this. What stands out to me um, is um, that overall, um, the British and the French were, um, from the early days, rather skeptical about what they would call the US hotting up the Cold War through propaganda and psychological warfare operations and, and uh, these kinds of things. Uh, and they exerted a measure of restraint on some rather enthusiastic cold warriors on, uh, uh, within the US establishment in Berlin. Um, Al United States was, um, uh, could not go it alone in Berlin. And so there was always close coordination with um, the British and the French. Um, and uh, I think that ultimately benefited the Western cause. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Last question. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'll stop short of nuclear holocaust, but we've all seen lots of movies, and this is maybe a simplistic story, but or question, but um, you said just a, your last sentence was the propaganda and those other things that they did. Uh, when we watch movies of that era, the, those guys go around killing each other a lot, and, and um, did, was there a lot of that stuff went on, or once in a while, or ever? Did, I mean, we get really upset because uh, every time something like that happens today, an isolated incident of that, but it, you know, the impression that Hollywood gives us is that kind of thing went on a lot. Well, Hollywood is Hollywood. Uh, they need a good story. Um, so um, uh, I would, I would, you know, uh, be rather skeptical that um, um, uh, Hollywood uh, has the proportions right here. Um, that said, um, the um, uh, the East-West confrontation in Berlin was uh, a brutal one. Um, uh, the um, East Germans and the Soviets um, uh, were masters at kidnapping um, West uh, Berliners and West Germans, especially those that were um, uh, connected to some of these German anti-communist organizations that were working with the US against the East. Um, uh, but as I also mentioned, um, there were certainly uh, US um, there were there were certainly um, sabotage and assassination attempts conducted by these German groups. Some of them doing things that had uh, collateral damage um, uh, in very unfortunate ways um, that um, were probably not fully condoned by the US, the US never fully controlled all these activities. What you also see in, in, in this, this report that I mentioned that kind of really jolts the, uh, the, the Truman administration and the McCloy's team into action uh, against the East that they specifically recommended uh, assassinations of um, uh, East German uh, or Soviet officials. I have not found any evidence of such um, uh, assassination attempts, plots in the US records. Um, so um, uh, I, I really don't want to go further than that speculating. Um, but uh, you know, you had, they, they estimate that in Berlin, in Berlin alone in the 1950s, you had 10,000 spies from both sides. 
just imagine it, 10,000 spies. Um, um, the United States had, you know, uh, uh, multiple intelligence organizations represented in Berlin. The Berlin Operation Base was the largest CIA base um, for, for, for a good part of the time, uh, for a good part of the Cold War. So um, um, there was a lot going on in Berlin. Um, 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 as I said, I haven't found any um, direct archival documentary evidence that the United States um, uh, supported um, uh, assassination attempts or other sort of deadly use of force uh, in, in, in this regard. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. I'm just always amazed that these insights and this great new takes after all these years come right out of our archive right here down the hall, 16 million pages worth of Truman-related. I understand you only read about 14 million of them, but still, <laughs> uh, you, you gleaned some great insights from them. So anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing uh, your insights, and congratulations again on this very prestigious award. And thank you all for being here. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you.